day good morning to all as we all know the 75th year of india's independence is being celebrated as azadi ka amrit mahotsav idnfa has been conducting a series of special sessions in this context of akam celebrations in this chain of events today we have with us dr sanjeev chopra a distinguished speaker who will deliver a talk on the title we the people of the states of bharat the making and unmaking of india's internal boundaries i thank each one of you who take time out for joining us for this talk today on that note let me introduce and welcome the chief guest of this beautiful morning first i now request shama zabeen participant of the psuc course to please welcome dr sanjeev chopra with a bouquet and uh, greeting on azadi ka amrit mahotsav i must thank mr arun rawat <coughs> and uh, my friend bharat jyoti and the two additional uh, directors sushil avasti pankaj agarwal and aarti and all of you for inviting me to be part of the azadi ka amrit mahotsav celebration friends uh, <coughs> you see every sovereign nation has something which only a sovereign nation can there are several times that maps and borders change but you see within the same country the number of times that the border has changed india holds a kind of a record maps will keep on changing it is inherent in the nature of geography it is inherent in the nature of politics that maps will change the very first lines of the preamble the preamble says we the people of india have so solemnly resolved and then you come to the first three articles of the constitution which say that this is the boundary this is the map of india and therefore it means that if this is the map of india then remember that not one inch of territory can be added and not one inch of territory can be ceded but within this formation changes can be made and there is a procedure by which a new state can be made a new state can be uh, the status of a state can be changed and let me tell you a very interesting thing when india was free or when india became independent in 1947 we had nine provinces then at that point of time it was called provinces there were nine provinces bombay madras central provinces united provinces and so on so on. there were 562 princely states right there was the lakadiv islands there was andaman nicobar right this was the formation of the country today in the 73rd year of the republic there is not one state whose boundary is not changed there is not one state whose name has been retained there is not one state in which there has been no addition deletion alteration so what you see is that changes keep taking place over time can we go to the first map 1947 you see 1947 there were nine provinces and there were 562 rulers 562 princely states in the country from very small states there were states which had a population of less than 1000 people and there were states as large as jammu kashmir as large as hyderabad you know hyderabad and jammu kashmir by themselves would be larger than many of the european countries now you see then what happens is that in 1950 we were able to reorganize our map then in 1952 the first hindi map of the country was made first time the map was made in hindi then in 1953 the first edition of andhra state came into being andhra has had three formations i don't know whether many of you are aware are you aware that andhra was first created in 1953 second version in 1956 and third version in 2014 and this has got great implications great implications then in 1956 <coughs> we had the state reorganization commission did you know that in 1954 there was a proposal to merge the two states it was called the roy sena proposal both the chief minister of bengal and the chief minister of bihar they felt that rather than have two states we should come become join hands and make one state 
That didn't, did not work out, we will come to that later. Let's move on. <coughs> okay, then you had Maharashtra and Gujarat happening in 1960. Uh, then in 1961, uh, the last bastion of Portuguese territories in Goa. That was demolished when we sent our army uh, and you know Goa was liberated. I'll tell you the story of why that happened in 1961 and why it did not happen before 1961. We'll tell you that story. Come on. Then in 1963, Nagaland was the first state which came out of the northeast, which came out of Assam in 1963. And that was a very important, significant milestone. Because when Nagaland was made, when Nagaland was made, the origins of Meghalaya and Arunachal and Mizoram, they were inbuilt into that. So once you take a decision A, decision B, C, D, E have to follow. 2014, we had Telangana. Now when you had Telangana, then that is yet another story. Because for the first time, a non-Hindi speaking state, I mean a non-Hindi language has got two states. So earlier what was happening was that before this, only Hindi as a language was adopted in several states. But with the coming up of Terengana, a regional language in this country, in fact, we do not use the word regional language now, we use the word Bhashas of Bharat, because it is inappropriate to call something regional and something national. Because as I said in the ship of thesis, you don't know which part is where, and therefore the center is not, there is no such thing as a center, because everything in here is and evolves. Uh, and then of course, in 2019, uh, we had Ladakh and Jammu Kashmir as separate territories, as separate union territories. So this is how the story of maps of India has been evolved. Let's move on to the first map. The map of India as we inherited it in 1947 is today entirely different from the map as it was. And the maximum changes that took place, took place between 1947. Some maps are more important than other maps. One is of course, the map of 1947 to the map of 1950. One thing I want you to notice. Up there, the word used is Tibet. India or British India never used the word China. We have always regarded that area as Tibet. Because according to our perception, according to our perception, this area was Tibet. Because we were basing it on the treaty of end of which Treaty of Shimla 1914 and remember there was this Mac Mahon line which we considered as the dividing line between India and Tibet. When India wanted to recognize Tibet, the letter from the Lai Lama's office was that we shall recognize you only if you give us back Dajaling, Sikkim because they are ours. So, you know, uh, we would have recognized Tibet and had we recognized, so this is all a very interesting chapter of our history. We wanted to recognize Tibet, but Tibet said we will recognize you only if Sikkim and Darjeeling is recognized and treated as a part of uh, Tibet. Obviously negotiations broke down and we did not recognize them and you know this kind of happened. Meanwhile, and that I must say, both Chiang Kai She and Mao Zedong said that they do not recognize the 1914 agreement between India and Tibet. Because they said Tibet is not competent to sign an agreement because Tibet is only a region of China and not an independent territory. So in this larger confusion, you know, uh, there were some negotiations which happened, some negotiations which failed. Uh, at that point of time, uh, our Prime Minister Mr. Nehru thought that, you know, if he aligns himself with, uh, with China, then maybe in the long run China will protect our interests in Tibet because Tibet at that point of time was not being very friendly to us, was not being very friendly to us for whatever reason. So in any case what happened was that by 1950, India recognized China and China recognized India. And at that time we were so miffed with Tibet that in 1952, the first map in Hindi, it brought in the word Keen on the Indian cartographic landscape. So let's move on to the map of 1952. In the map of 1952, which was the first Hindi map of this country, you suddenly find China, 1962, uh, 1952. You see, this was a great victory for China. A great victory for China because China suddenly appeared on the map of India. And before that, China had not appeared on the map of India. 
but you find in this map that the word Tibet still continues. In 1954, right, and, and that is so China said that look, you must not have Tibet on the map of India. And you will notice that in the map of 1956, there was no reference to Tibet on the map of India. So um, this is the map of India in 1952. It was decided that the 13 Telugu speaking districts of the erstwhile Madras state would be made into what is now called the Andhra state. Now there were Telugu speaking areas in the Hyderabad state also, in the erstwhile Hyderabad. But no decision could be taken on that, but one decision was taken. That was that we shall appoint a state's reorganization commission and the state's reorganization commission was appointed with three people. The first of them was Justice Fazal Ali. The second was K.M. Panekar and the third was H.N. Kunzu. After the <coughs> state's reorganization commission was, was constituted, then this commission went around the country. They received lakhs of representations, they traveled the whole country and they came with certain conclusions. 1956, the key recommendations of the SRC were that the four <coughs> South Indian languages, the four South Indian languages, Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil and Telugu, all of them should be given an independent status because earlier what was happening was that in the south there was one formation called Hyderabad which had Marathi speaking, Telugu speaking uh, people and in, in the area which was then the Madras presidency you had all these four languages and then you had the kingdoms of Travancore and Cochin in which Malayalam was being spoken. So, the recommendations of the state's reorganization. So, in the map of 1956, this is 56, right? Let's go down. Okay, now one more thing I want to show you. On this map of 19, Tibet disappears. This go, this go up, this go up. Ask super day for See, China, China. Tibet has disappeared from India's political imagination. Therefore, children who would be in ninth or 10th standards or, you know, who would be in their things at that point of time, they did not they did not see Tibet as a neighboring country. They saw China as a neighboring country. Dr. Ambedkar had a comment to me. He said that you have done alkanization of the South and consolidation of the North. Ambedkar said that you have strengthened the Hindi speaking belt of the North. And for all times to come, political power will now remain in the North. Of course, the present Prime Minister has shifted that paradigm. Gujarat <laughs> is almost Hindi speaking. You know, but in the sense that what he meant was that, you know, this is the balkanization of the South and the consolidation of the North. And Ambedkar had another very interesting suggestion. He said that, why don't you make Hyderabad the winter capital of the country? In 1960, Maharashtra and Gujarat, they were separated. Because, you know, the logic for not separating uh, the Bombay presidency was, that the capital of Bombay, Bombay was actually controlled by the Gujarati. I mean the business was with the, was with the Gujarati, the population was Marathi, and there was a lot of uh, ash between these two communities. There were many proposals at that. One proposal was that why don't we make Bombay into a union territory. And then minus Bombay, you could have Gujarat and you could have Maharashtra and you'll have Bombay as a union territory. But the Marathas did not like it at all. They said nothing to him. And in fact, Sidi Deshmukh, Sidi Deshmukh, who was then the finance minister of the country, he resigned. He said that, you know, the Prime Minister has made a statement without reference to the cabinet, I don't accept. So he resigned from the from Nehru's cabinet on the basis uh, that, you know, he had taken an arbitrary decision. But what happened was that Maharashtra and Gujarat were created in 1960. Unfortunately, it led to a lot of deaths. But finally, again, and that is again the strength of this country. That once there is a, you see, another thing, another very interesting thing happened in 1960. And that shows that political parties cannot control their local governments. At the national level, neither the Communist Party of India, nor the Jana Sangha, nor the Congress wanted uh, Gujarat and Maharashtra to be divided. But such was the popular flow of events that cutting across party lines, the Samyuk, the Maharashtra Parishad was made, the Maharashtra Coordination Committee was made, and the Gujarat uh, Committees were made. So they defied their political parties. 
all political parties, again, it's on the record, that all dominant political parties in the country did not want Bombay state to be divided. But the ground level, uh, you know, uh, contest for these two states was so intense that they had to accept uh, this separation. And Bombay, of course, uh, Bombay continued to be part of Malaysia. Now we move on to 1961. 1961 is important because <laughs> Portugal, you know, you see this black tape, just as Pura Dikai is. You see, the map of India had already been printed. And at that point of time, just below, you know, it was written Goa Portuguese territory. Now, those must have been days of economy drive. And the Survey of India must have thought that rather than make a new map, let's just put a black tape over Portuguese position. So just go, you will see where Goa is. You will find that, you know, wherever the word Goa was written, they put a black tape over it. So I have, in that chapter, I am calling it black tape over Portuguese position. Now, I must tell you some very interesting story. You heard about the Berlin Wall. Now, you will wonder what is the connection between the Berlin Wall and the liberation of Goa. You see, when the NATO agreement was signed, the NATO agreement committed all the North Atlantic Treaty Organization members to support each other in whatever war they had. At the time when the NATO treaty was being signed, it was not specified whether that war is limited to North Atlantic or whether this could be a war anywhere in the world. Portuguese, Portugal had taken the interpretation that if there is a war between India and Portugal, even in India, then the entire NATO must come and support Portugal. That was one. Second, there was a very ancient treaty between the King of Portugal and the King of England, which had bound these two kings in perpetuity to support each other in the event of a war. When the Berlin Wall started, then NATO interpreted and said that our alliance is limited to fights in the North Atlantic. And the moment that decision was taken, within 48 hours, Mr. Nehru had declared in the House, in the Parliament, that now you will be sending our troops to liberate Goa. Now you move on to 1963. <coughs> you see, what had happened was that the States Reorganization Commission was of the view that states must be financially and administratively viable. They were in favor of larger states. So they said that is the reason why they did not accept Punjab's division. That is the reason why they did not want Assam to be broken up because they felt that a small state would not be administrated. But there was a long standing agitation of the Nagas. And uh, to cut a long story short, it was felt that in order to settle the Naga dispute, in order to settle that issue, we will create, I mean, so parts of Yunzang, uh, parts of the Nefa and parts of the earlier districts of Nagaland, they were made into a state with less than 3 lakh population. At that very point of time, it was clear that the state may not be financially viable at all. It will continuously depend on assistance from the government of India. But a decision was taken that in case there is an ethnic insurgency, and in case there is a group of ethnic insurgents who are willing to settle for a state within the overall territory of the country, we shall enter into a settlement. And that was the first settlement which happened in 1960. A very important settlement because many people lost their lives. Uh, the, the person who had to become chief minister, he was killed in the process, so Sakire. So that is how the state of Nagaland was made. But when Nagaland was made, in the making of Nagaland, the making of the other Northeastern states was also part of the was also part of the process. So from 1959, because by 1959 our relationship with with the China had spoiled, and Dalai Lama came over to uh, to Tawang Monastery. Now Tawang Monastery also is an interesting story. Tawang Monastery was taken over by a person called Major Bob Cutting. So one day he uh, went and took over the Tawang Monastery, which Tibet was claiming as theirs. So, because he took over the Tawan Monastery with the support of Jairam uh, Das Dalatram, who was then the governor of Assam, of course, Nehru was slightly upset. He said that, why have you taken over this area without... But they took over that place and that was very good because, because Tawan was 
became a part of India. That is why it was easy for Dalai Lama to to be rescued and to be brought in over here. So that's another story of. Uh, so Bob Cutting had a role even in the in the settlement of the Nagaland. But he was a great. In fact, the only person who saw service in the army. He was the major in the army. He had been in the Indian Frontier Administrative Service. He became the Chief Secretary of Nagaland, and then he became our ambassador to Burma, which was, I mean, then now Myanmar, then Burma. So a great legend of this country, somebody whom we should have recognized much more than we have done. <clears throat> so let's move on. 1963 says, then we move on to 1966. By 1966, the Punjabi Subha agitation had started. Now, about the Punjabi Subha agitation, you see, immediately after independence. The Sikhs were wanting a separate state. When the first delegation of the Sikhs went to Dr. Ambedkar, who was then the Union Law Minister, they, uh, Dr. Ambedkar told them that look, we will not settle for a religious state in the country. But if you were to ask for a state in which linguistic uh, basis is the is the farm, or or you want a state for Punjabi-speaking people. That is something which the government of India will agree to. So you ask for a Punjabi suit. So then this whole story started from the Punjabi suit, this agitation, that agitation. But to cut a long story short, and meanwhile uh, in Haryana also the movement for a separate state started. So that's a separate story uh, about how this happened. But in 1966, Punjab and Haryana were also made into states. Himachal continued to be a union territory till 1971, and in 1971, Himachal was also declared a state. Now, Sikkim ka kahani ye hai. Sikkim was actually a lepcha king. It was taken over by the Bhutias. But you see, what happened was that it was a lepcha kingdom taken over by the Bhutias. But both had a great, uh, you know, uh, sort of proximity because both were Lamaistic tradition of the Bhutias. Now, part of the aspect of being a Buddhist Lama is that a lot of people turn monks. And therefore, the reproductive rate goes down in these societies. It is also possible that, given the harsh geographic conditions, or given the harsh topographic conditions, Lamaism or monasticism had become a way of life. Because more than that, perhaps it may not have been possible to sustain. That could have been one of the reasons why. But to cut a long story short, in 1870s, these. Uh, large monasteries, when they found that they are not in a position to cultivate the land physically, so they invited the Nepalese to come and start cultivating their lands. So the first set of about five to ten thousand Nepalese moved into the area which is now Sikkim. By 1900, the population of Nepalese started to grow because they were not uh, in the Lamaistic tradition. They were, uh, they had many children, and by 1947. 60% of the population of Sikkim was Nepalese, and 40% population was 20% Lepchas, 20% Bhutias, and 60% Nepalese. And the population of Nepalese was on the rise, whereas the population of Bhutias and Lepchas was stagnant or becoming less. Now, the Chogyal, <coughs> the assembly that the Chogyal had created, that had 60 seats. And he said, "I will give 20 seats to Lepchas, 20 seats to Bhutias, and 20 seats to Nepalis." Now, when you do this sort of a formation, you are actually disenfranchising the Nepalis because it is no longer a principle of one man, one vote. Nepalis were the largest in number, but they did not have the adequate political power. Therefore, the Nepali, the Sikkim Nepalese Congress in 1947 itself said, "Please make us a part of democratic India." That we do not want to be part of Sikkim, we want to be a part of India. There was a lot of myth that is spread around that India did this, India. Did. I mean, India could do that only because the majority population did not want to be part of Sikkim, because they did not have equal rights in Sikkim. Anyway, Sikkim was placed under the Indian Frontier Administrative Service. It was a new service which uh, for the border area which had been there, and uh, then of course you know that Chogyal married uh, this American, uh, you know, beauty. Called Pope Cook, and there was a whirlwind marriage and all that stuff. So they started getting a lot of heirs, you know. And because uh, he had been given the title of Chogyal, and his wife had been given the title of Galmo, and because the state was being managed by the Ministry of External Affairs, which was a tactical mistake, 
It should never have been given to the Ministry of External Affairs. It should have been handled like any other state because the Maharaja of Sikkim was the Vice Chairman of the Chamber of Princes. Unlike the, the King of Bhutan, which was not part of the Chamber of Princes. Unlike Nepal, which was not part of the Chamber. Therefore, therefore that is how uh, we needed two constitutional amendments to make Sikkim a part of it. <coughs> because first we, Sikkim became an associate state that required an amendment to the constitution. And then it required another amendment to the 35th and 36th amendment to the constitution to make Sikkim a part of India because as per our article 1 and 3, not an inch can be given away and not an inch can be taken. So that is the story of Sikkim. Now you see, the next major change that happens now, is the formation of these three states of Uttarakhand, Jharkhand and Chhattis. Now remember that at some point of time, the Bharatiya Jansan, which is the predecessor party, sorry, the predecessor party to the Bharatiya Janata Party, they were against smaller states. They were against smaller states. And their logic was that, that you know, you should have large states, India should not be divided. But when it came to Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, it was realized that the demographics of these states have changed completely. They, had, they were no longer tribal states, typical tribal states in that sense because a lot of projects had happened. So a new identity, a new Jharkhandi identity, a new Chhattisgarhi identity had started happening. So that is one story. And in the case of Uttarakhand, it happened because of the Mandal Commission. You see, as per the Mandal Commission, seats had to be reserved for the OBCs. Now in Uttarakhand, there are no OBCs. Uttarakhand is a Thakur, Brahman dominated area. There are about, Sir Rawat will tell me about 40-50% Thakurs, more than that. And about 20-25% Brahmins, about 11% scheduled castes, about 5% scheduled tribes and OBCs would be just 1 or 2%, 3% at best. That too in Udham Singh Nagar and Haridwar which were not originally thought to have been part of Uttarakhand. Right. The original concept of Uttarakhand, where the Chipko movement was there, or the or, or what the UKD was asking for, did not include them in Nagar. So in that formation, <coughs> but because of the Central Commission, 27% seats had to be reserved in the government for OBCs, which would have meant that for all the examinations that would be done in UP, there would have been a major induction of the of the non Uttarakhandi population into Uttarakhand. And till that time, Uttarakhandis had been the dominant people in even the UP Secretariat because they were more educated. Because the education levels in Uttarakhand were better than the education levels in say Beret, Saharanpur, Nao, Balia and all these places. So whereas earlier, all the Uttarakhandis were dominating UP because of the Mandal Commission Reservation, UP plainsmen would have dominated the uh, Uttarakhandis. Therefore, it was to protest against the Mandal Commission. Mandal Commission is very clear that in Mandal Commission it will be on the basis of the population of the state. Right? So the state population became the dominant factor and that is why at, if Mulam Singh at that point of time had said that alright for these hill districts the Mandal Commission will be kept in abeyance, then maybe Uttarakhand would not have been made. We don't know. And then the, the, the way in which the agitation was treated, the way in which the agitation was treated by a regional party. You see, there is also a difference between Regional parties and national parties. You see, no offence meant to Mamta Banerjee or to Mr. Stalin or to Mayavati or to one of the regional or to Akali Dal. But they have no base outside the state. And therefore the way they will look at a problem is very different from the way the BJP or the Congress will look at a problem. Of course, these days the CPI and CPI are no longer very dominant parties. But at some point of time, they were also dominant parties. The way a national party which has to fight elections in five states their view on a subject will have to be moderated and would have to be calibrated uh, because it cannot be just the one way. Mamta Banerjee can take, Mamta Banerjee for example takes the view that I will not share Tista waters with Bengal, with Bangladesh. Because she is only looking at, at, at Bengal as a consequence. Whereas from the point of view of the nation, it is Bangladesh has got a border, not only with Bengal, it's got a border with, uh, with the Sam, it's got a border with Tripura, it's got a border with, with many northeastern states, right? So India's perception of the India-Bangladesh problem would be very different from the perception of a state chief minister on that same issue. So this is how the 2003 <coughs> states were made. In 2014, we had Andhra Pradesh, Telangana again getting uh, separated because 
of the same. Again, here, the issue was one of, of development. The issue was one of how do you, and more than development, it is also a question of how much share do you have in the political power. At the end of the day, everybody would like to develop, but everybody would also like to have a share in the political power. Right? So that is uh, 2014, the separation of Telangana. And finally, in 2019, 5th August, you had the two union territories of Ladakh and Jammu Kashmir being created. Can we go to the last map? Now, you see, this is a very significant change in the map because what happens now is that the crest of India is now Ladakh. So suddenly the area of Jammu Kashmir has become very limited. The area of Ladakh is much bigger in terms of such. You know what happens is that when you say on an international scale on a map, there's a problem in Punjab, there's a problem in Assam, there's a problem in JMK. Earlier it was felt that the problem is there in such a big area. Because such was the size of Jammu Kashmir. Now Jammu Kashmir has become much smaller. So it is not that the problem has become smaller. But the visual impact of the problem has certainly become much smaller. Because Ladakh is now the crest of India. It is not, it is so long in Jammu Kashmir, which is the crest of India. So friends, <coughs> this brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, you know, this is that nations keep evolving. Nations which have an open mind about their internal boundaries will always be more successful than nations which do not have an open mind. Before I close, the question that will come to everybody's mind would be Gorkha land, Bodo land, all these other agitations which happen. Now, the reason why Gurkha land or Bodo land cannot be considered is that the area which they want, the Gurkhas are not in the majority even in, in that area. So you cannot concede an area. You see, you can concede Punjabi Suba only if the majority population in the geographical area that you want to call Punjabi Suba would be Punjabi speaking. Now if Punjabi Suba was to say that no, I want to include parts of Himachal Pradesh, Himachal will not want that. Punjabis might want a greater Punjab with Himachal being a part of Punjab, but why would Himachal want to be part of it? So, when the area that Gurkha land is demanding, or when the area with the Budos are demanding, even in the area in which they are demanding, now historically, yes, it could have, it's a fact that historically it could have been there. But then so many things have changed. Take Kuch Bihar, for example. Kuch Bihar was actually a coach, tribal district. But after the, after partition of the country, such was the influx of the uh, of Bengalis that it's become a Bengali district now. So now asking for Koch Bihar to be part of Bodo land, I mean historically yes at some point of time uh, Kochis were Bodo, but not today. Today 90% of, uh, not 90 but about 80, 85% uh, of Koch Bihar is, uh, is, is Bengali. Speaking. So it's a dynamic situation, it's an evolving situation. We have to take pride in the fact that Bharat has been able to, to, to understand the aspirations of a people. It has been able to adjust to the assertions of people. And then finally it has come across with some sort of a thing in which there is some give and take, there is some you know compromise, but on the whole the nation is again growing strong. Jai Hind, Jai Bhai.